the consensus approach to decision making is both very good, but also very frustrating. It's good in the sense that everybody has a voice from the smallest island in the Pacific or Caribbean that is a member to the largest country has an equal voice. But at the same time, getting all to agree is very difficult, a bit like herding cats. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive and also a leadership advisor. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. Also, you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. I am so thrilled about today's episode as we get to talk with a global leader who, at least in my opinion, is the definition of resilience and overcoming adversity. And she seems to be someone who actually thrives on it. Her career has been focused on solving big global problems. And in the process, she's arguably made her country, Nigeria, and quite frankly, the world a better place. Now, Clark, I'm, of course, really interested to hear our guests' view on some of the big topical issues that we're wrestling with, such as sustainability, the evolving role of the World Trade Organization, and many others. But actually, I'm really curious to get to know the person inside. This lady has dealt with adversity on a level that is kind of unknown to us living in, in the developed world, and she's a big risk taker. I really want to know how she has thought about the big challenges that she's faced over her career. We think we have tough issues and tough times. You know, she had nothing. Mm -hmm. And then she grows up in a war. She goes to Harvard. She works in D.C. She goes back to Nigeria. Her mother gets kidnapped. Um, she takes on one of the probably nearly impossible jobs of running the WTO and actually gets to a big agreement. She's got to be tough, but she also clearly is incredibly smart. And I'm told she has a great sense of humor. So this is one of the more interesting guests I think we've ever had in the podcast. So Clark, tell our listeners who we will be talking to today. Our guest today is Dr. Ngozi Ongojo Iwela, who's the first woman and first African to serve as the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Dr. Ngozi is a global finance expert, an MIT-trained economist, international development professional with 30 years experience globally. She's worked all over the world her previous roles include being chair of the board of Gavi, the alliance that we've got to know so well during the vaccine distribution that we talked about in one of our earlier podcasts. And she served as Nigeria's finance minister, briefly as foreign minister, and the first woman to hold both positions. Dr. Ngozi is also the co-author of Woman in Leadership, Real Lives, Real Lessons, written with former prime minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, who, of course, was our guest as well. So she is an amazing person and truly a global citizen. Dr. Ngozi, welcome to Redefiners. We are delighted that you can join us. Thank you very much. Dr. Ngozi, we would love to give our listeners a chance to get to know you a little bit better because you have had a fascinating personal background. Take us back to the early years and tell us a little bit about your early life in Nigeria. When I was a baby, more or less, my parents left me with my grandmother in the village mm -hmm and uh, w went to Germany as, uh, with scholarships to study. Okay. So I actually grew up with my grandmother in the village, which was really good uh, because I got to learn to do everything till I was almost nine, uh, to, to cook, to fetch water. It was very, very good early training mm. uh, in the village. And then following that, my parents came back, uh, having fin done their doctoral and master's degrees. And there were academics in yes. uh, one of the universities. So I went from village to, to a university campus. So that was quite a change. Um, and it was a little bit of an enchanted uh, childhood at that point. It was really nice. 
Um, but I'd say that um, the early village experiences with my grandmother were really formative um, because they showed you were living in a place where you saw people who didn't have enough, didn't have as much as you had. You saw people trying to make do. And so it taught you values, mm-hmm. out of value things. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was a teenager, we also lived through a war. Uh, when my parents lost everything. So it's a little bit like watching the war in Ukraine now, people mm-hmm. losing all their belongings and running helter-skelter. Uh, so when I was 12, there was a, lo- a war in Nigeria, the Nigeria Biafra War, the Nigerian Civil War, and we were in it and lost everything. So that was another formative period uh, where I say I learned to live with nothing so I can live with yeah. nothing and I can live with everything. <laughs> everything. Do you know, Dr. Ngozi, what you say um, ch- chimes a little bit with, with my background. So I'm originally Iranian mm-hmm. um, and I was very young when the revolution happened in 79. And my parents also went from having a very comfortable life to basically having nothing because everything was confiscated. And actually, to this day, my father says that that's the best thing that could have happened to his kids. <laughs> because to your point, you yeah. go from having a lot to having nothing, and it just teaches you hard work, resilience, the importance of values. So Absolutely. I fully um, agree with your sentiment. So then um, the Civil War happens. You then study in the U.S. Um, it's not any old university in the U.S. I mean, you go to some of the best in the U.S. Tell us a bit about your academic life. Well, after the war, you know, we lost three years. I didn't go to school for three years in the war. But um, at, during the last year, my mother opened a school and started to, to teach uh, some of the young children around. So somehow after three years of war, I was able to catch up and uh, took the normal exams. And uh, then I really told my, my parents that I'd like to travel a little bit and see the rest of the world. And my father said it was a luxury. The only way I could get to mm. travel was if I got into the best university in any country who was willing to support that. So that's how I ended up applying to Cambridge University in the UK and to Harvard in, in the US. And I got into both and uh, chose to go to Harvard. But my family also kind of edged me yeah. into it because my mother had decided to, she had a master's and she decided to do her PhD at the time at Boston University. And they said, well, she can keep an eye on you. Uh, very good. <laughs> Which I didn't, I didn't like at all, you know, but my, my father and everybody said, well, she'll be there at Boston University and you'll be across the river at Harvard. She can keep an eye on you. That is a great story of all the mothers saying it's one thing to go to the local soccer game and something else to say, I think I'll get a PhD across the river from my daughter. <laughs> I, I must try that with my son. I think he will hate me for it, but I love the idea. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and did you know did you know at that stage that you had a passion for politics, economics? Did did you kind of have a burning passion as a student or is that something that's come over time? I didn't actually have a passion for politics. I'm not a very good politician. So I was in government for years. I guess when you're a finance minister, you have to, to know politics to be able to survive for as long as I did. But I can't say that in university, I, I had a passion for politics, neither for economics. And I'll tell you why. My father is a mathematical economist. Mm. Uh, and when I was uh, uh, nine, I remember one day I was, I really was bothering him as he was trying to do his notes because I wanted to go to the library or to the bookstore to get a book. I was a prolific reader and he just wanted to keep me quiet. So he took this heavy tome, gave it to me and said, read the first chapter. I'm going to test you on it. And it was an economics textbook. It must have been Samuelson's or something. I now realize later. And it was so boring. Yeah. So I was reading this thing. I remember sitting in the study with him and crying. And then afterwards, he, he asked me some questions. Of course, I didn't understand anything. I was nine and a half or something, going to 10. And I hated it. And I said, whatever this subject is, I'll never study it. So I didn't go in <laughs> went in. I thought economics was boring <laughs> and terrible. But when I got to, to Harvard, um, I actually wanted to study, to do geography because I was really interested in rural urban, urban dynamics. 
And I found that the closest to it they had, they didn't have that, but they had economics. So I went in and I loved it. Uh, and I must mm. say that I don't regret at all. My father, of course, was chuckling all the way because I told him I was never going to study economics, but I ended up doing that. So it's a little bit, you see, everything is a little bit accidental. <laughs> but it's a wonderful profession, and I thoroughly enjoy being an economist. You learn so much about the world mm -hmm. from doing that. But such a change when you raised your children... So you're in Washington, D.C., you're at the World Bank for over 25 years, and while you may have lived with nothing and lived with everything, those four children grew up in Washington, which is, you know, a nice place to grow up, to say the least. Mm -hmm. And then you say, enough, we're going back to Nigeria, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to become the finance minister. Tell us about that conversation with your children versus your father handing you an economics textbook, and what made you decide to make that move? Well, I have to tell you that whilst I went back to become finance minister, my children stayed in Washington with my husband. But, uh, no. I, but let me tell you that every single year they had to go back to Nigeria. So regardless, they didn't move with me, but they came home from the time they were young children. We went home every year. And home meant going to the village because we wanted them to make sure that they were very much in touch with what was happening on the ground. Uh, and so while I was at home, they visited back and forth. Uh, but that decision came, um, I had decided at some point that uh, when I joined the bank, actually, I was only going to be there two and a half years. I just wanted some international training, and then I wanted to go back home. But I ended up loving the career and, and the work and staying there. And then I, at some point, I said, I really have to go home and contribute, because that's what I was brought mm. up to know and believe, mm. that you work for others. Education is a luxury. It's not just for yourself. It's also for you to do something to help others. So I determined at some point I'd take a leave of absence and go back home. The president, when he won a second term, President Obasanjo, uh, went and asked the president of the World Bank if he could release me to be finance minister. So he didn't ask mm. me. He asked President hmm. Wolfenson. And uh, so the story is I was in my office. By this time, I was the vice president and corporate secretary of the World Bank. And, and President Wolfenson walked into my office and said, you're going back home to be finance minister. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> because, uh, and I said, what do you mean? And he said, your president just called and asked me to release you. And of course, you're going. That's the right thing to do. Hmm. Wow. So I was a little bit furious that I hadn't been asked, but I, at the same time excited. So I, I took it and I, I went home because I wanted to give back. And, you know, I mean, Nigeria is one of the most exciting countries in the world. It, it, it has its problems and challenges, but it's, it's really so vibrant. So I went and basically led the effort. And I'm happy to say we got the $30 billion wiped off our books, very proud of that. And that really unleashed a period of economic growth for the country. We talk in this podcast, Redefiners, about redefining moments. Was that the moment for you? You had this both enchanted childhood and fetching water childhood. You had both <laughs> ends of the extreme. Mm -hmm. And now you come back, you say, Nigeria is vibrant and you feel alive. Did you feel alive? conquering all that debt, but yet facing the complexity of Nigerian culture. Yeah, it was uh, quite tough and quite complex. You know, I worked with an economic team, a set of colleagues in cabinet and outside. We made up the economic team and we worked really hard to implement reforms, which we needed the IMF to say that we were reforming uh, and that mm -hmm. our economy was going in the right direction in order for the Paris Club to agree to talk to us about uh, forgiving some of the debt. So it was quite tough. The president led the charge. President Obasanjo, it was his passion. It was his mission. He really wanted this debt to be cleared up. And I tried to execute. So um, it gave me my gray hairs, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite tough trying to get uh, the G7 to accept to work on this. They were accreditors, you know. Most of the mm. debt was to the G7 countries. It's a long story, but we implemented the reforms and finally we were able to negotiate 
at the Paris Club for three days nonstop, locked in a room, until we came to some agreement. We had $18 billion written off completely wow. Wow. of the $30 wow. billion, and then we executed something new. They had never allowed a developing country to buy back some of its debt, and I led that, and we bought back the rest of our debt at 25 cents on the dollar. So that was really Fantastic. something to be proud of. Well, and, and I think the success of that, Dr. Ngozi, speaks volumes about your resilience, right? Mm. It, resilience is one of the things that as leadership advisors, we talk to our clients about all the time, right? The ability to just keep going despite all the challenges and adversity. Um, you've certainly had shown a lot of it professionally, but I'm actually really interested to hear some of the personal stories around your resilience, particularly when you were finance minister. You know, despite the successes, you know, some people were in favor of you remaining. Some people were against you. And in fact, they kidnapped your mother mm. and would only release her in the condition of you resigning. I mean, it, it's a truly horrible thing to go through. Tell us a little bit about how you dealt with that and how, how you thought about that. So the first time I went back as finance minister, and then I went back a second time under president. Good luck, Jonathan. And it was then we were trying to clean up uh, some corruption in the oil sector. Mm -hmm. So we produce oil, but we can't refine all of mm -hmm. it. So we buy refined oil, we send it out and subsidize it. So those marketers involved in this, we, we, the, we found some fraud was being committed. Mm -hmm. We audited about... 12 billion, or is it $11 billion worth of uh, oil accounts and found fraud of about 2.4, 2.5 billion. And so we refused mm. to pay the marketers who said they were owed that money. Um, mm. And that was how, you know, then my mother got kidnapped for that. I wrote about it in a book. So that's why everybody knows about it. It's difficult to really talk about it. But, you know, I wasn't brave at all. You know, I was... Uh, you were not? No, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I felt horrible. I felt uh, mm. it was the worst moment of my life when I found out she had been kidnapped and the people were making demands for me to go and resign. They did, uh, just announced my resignation and leave the country. Um, you know, it was a terrible moment. I didn't do that, but you didn't know whether she was going to come out alive, whether yeah. she would be killed. And in fact, when she came out of this situation after five days of not being fed, she, it, it was such a horrific story. She overheard them talking about how to dispose of her body. Mm. Yeah. whilst they held her in captivity. And that must be the most horrible thing to hear people talking about what to do with your body when you're dead. Um, so, mm. yeah, it was a very difficult time. I can't say I was particularly brave. But so why did you not resign then? Why did you not give in? What kept you going? Yeah, I would have if I was on my own because they thought that, okay, if you don't resign, your mother might be killed. Yeah. But my father said I shouldn't. My father refused. He said we're not going to be blackmailed. And, you know, he had a, a, a really, he was a, a, a statistician, an economist and demographer. And he said to me, look, you know, your mother is 83. We're in our 80s. We've outlived our usefulness. So, uh, you know, she doesn't come back. You just have to internalize that. Wow. But you're not going to resign because that's what these people want. So it was his sheer willpower. I can't claim that um, I was somehow very brave. I wasn't. I, I was huddled in my room feeling the worst. But he insisted I shouldn't. The president insisted I should not resign mm. and that I should actually go about my business. So I went to work. I went to the cabinet meeting, uh, you know, I guess the people saw I wasn't going anywhere. Um, but, but it was a very, very difficult time. Eventually, there was a huge, massive manhunt for her. Police everywhere was. And I think the heat led to them, you know, maybe they left her alone in the forest where they were holding her and she was able to run away and, and run out. And that's how she, story. she escaped. Yeah, she's still alive. Wow, she's ninety-one. Wow, While she's still living, <laughs> to honor her, 
Uh, but you can't really discuss it with her. If you bring it up, she starts to shake so terribly. Mm. Wow. So it's, it's not something you can, you know, you can, the fear of what happened to her is still lives with her today. So it's, uh, it still lives with me because we can't, if you mention it to her, she literally starts to shake. It was a horrible experience. Yeah. Well, we talk about resilience, the fortitude between your grandmother, your mother, and your father and you. There's a lot of fortitude in those genes as well, which makes for great people and great leaders. Thank and I you. would imagine fortitude in the WTO is also something you need. Um, <laughs> in the world we live in, which is so complex right now, you've taken on yet another tough challenge. You talk about the almost impossible job of reviving the WTO. Why did you take that role, yet another defining role in your life, and what made the opportunity attractive to you? You, you really do take on some serious challenges in your career. I know. People are always telling me that. I, I think the purpose of the WTO is so attractive. It's one of the most consequential organizations in the world, and its purpose is to enhance living standards, to help create employment, and to support sustainable development. What could be better than that? It's all about people and about working for people and enhancing people's lives. So that's what is so attractive. The purpose of the WTO is just very attractive. So that's what, and I asked myself, you know, why is it not doing more of this? You know, why mm. does trade have such a bad name when it shouldn't really? Why does the WTO, why is it looked upon the way it is as an organization that is not functioning? Uh, you know, because over time, the WTO was doing very well, but over time, something seemed to happen. So the challenge of uh, and I uh, going there and trying to see if we could do better was certainly one of the reasons. Can we make it work, live up to its purpose and really deliver more for the world? And what's the answer to that? Uh, absolutely, yes. What are the changes that you've made? Yes, it's not been easy, but, you know, we have great hardworking staff. We have members. We just needed a win to show that the organization can do it. And we had a highly successful ministerial meeting in June. And after a mm -hmm. couple of decades of several negotiations not working, we were able to close them. Members were able to uh, agree. And that's pretty remarkable that in June we could mm. do that when there's so much geopolitical tension. We had everyone around the table, China and the U.S. and the EU, Russia and Ukraine, everybody developing and developed countries. So uh, it was quite, quite a feat. And um, I give all the members worked really hard to get there. We'll be back after a quick break with Sarah Vermeer, an executive director in our Brussels office. Sarah shares insights into how you can identify effective, sustainable leaders in your organization. We hear a lot about the need for more sustainable leaders in today's organizations. But there seems to be a gap between talking about sustainability versus truly impacting the business. In fact, 45% of C-suite leaders admit that the driving force behind their company's sustainability strategy is brand management, while only 20% say it is firmly rooted in real value creation. So how can you better connect the dots between sustainability and value creation in your organization? It comes down to identifying and developing effective sustainable leaders. These leaders possess a sustainability mindset made up of four key elements. First, they tend to think more holistically. They are curious and they are able to see the interconnectedness of their business their industry, and broader global markets. Second, they think long-term, setting audacious goals coupled with a well-thought-out plan of action. They possess courage and resilience when faced with setbacks or internal resistance. Third, to make better decisions, they include a wide range of viewpoints from a diverse set of stakeholders, as they know the best ideas might come from unexpected places. And finally, Sustainable leaders are not afraid of disruption. They recognize that innovation often requires challenging traditional approaches, so they seek out the best available data to make better decisions. Identifying and developing next-generation leaders with a sustainable mindset requires focus, intent, and a proactive approach. But the payoff 
is well worth it. Sustainable leaders are vital to not only develop more holistic leadership, but also future-proof your business. To learn more about how to develop sustainable leaders in your organization, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. And now back to our conversation with Dr. Ngozi Ongojo Iwela. Dr. Ngozi, you've got 164 countries mm. in the World Trade Organization. Um, and for you to pass any regulation or reform, you need to have every single one of those countries agree to it. Oh, members. Oh, your members. Mm -hmm. How on earth do you do that? I mean, I, I struggle when I have three people in my client to, to kind of agree and come to a consensus or, you know, better still, we have a hard time agreeing on what's for dinner in my family. <laughs> how do you get to your point? How do you get such different countries with different points of view and different political agendas to agree? Well, um, you know, that's the, the tough part is this what you just hit on, uh, Nanaz, the consensus approach to decision making is both very good, but also very frustrating. It's good in the sense that everybody has a voice from the smallest island in the Pacific or Caribbean that is a member to the largest country has an equal voice. That's what makes it attractive to them. But at the same time, like you said, getting all to agree is very mm. difficult, a bit like herding cats. But, um, <laughs> but, but um, let's say that not accepting no for an answer and just being determined that some of the things that were being worked on are so consequential, so important, and it's not good enough that we should spend 20 years negotiating an agreement that would see to the mm. sustainability of our oceans and fisheries. We just had to get it done. Or the TRIPS waiver, which is designed to allow developing countries to produce vaccines that would save lives. So it's how important these things are, trying to focus people that these things really matter and we've got to find a way to break through. Mm. There were days of agony, there were times of trying to find configurations to bring like-minded members together with non-like-minded and, and getting them to talk to each other. But I would say that um, with a lot of effort, members began to see a common purpose in trying to get some of these agreements done. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of nitty gritty work behind it, but we did it. Has it been for you as much about winning hearts as minds? Is that when you talked about purpose, is, is that what it takes is to kind of win the, the hearts, not just kind of the rational thinking? So I deal at three levels with the ambassadors mm -hmm. in Geneva who are the negotiators, with the ministers to whom they report in the capitals, mm -hmm. and with the leaders, the prime ministers and presidents. So it's constant weaving be between the three, yep. and it's a combination. You've got to rekindle in people's hearts the need to do these things because people outside expect it of us. Yeah. Uh, delivering the fishery subsidies agreement was about delivering sustainable development goal SDG 14.6. And the WTO had actually been asked by the UN Secretary General to deliver that. And that sees to our fisheries being sustainable, our oceans. So this is, this is big. This is for the world mm -hmm. that you're doing this. So it's a combination of both rekindling excitement in people that the purpose, they're working, what they're working on is really beyond us and needs to be done for the good of the world and, and the good of people. Um, and the same time, heads. Uh, you need heads because negotiations is hard work and uh, mm. people need to know when to compromise and give in and when to insist on their point. And it's not easy at all. We were here, the last 48 hours was nonstop negotiations. It took... It took five days, of which the last 48 hours were here in the WTO nonstop. Nobody went home. Yeah. Ministers were locked in, negotiating. <laughs> <laughs> Just one last question. We've heard discussion about the reset of stakeholders and stakeholder capitalism, particularly just as you were talking about one of the SDGs and the fisheries. Where do you see the WTO having a voice in this discussion around the great reset about more stakeholders, particularly as we talk about sustainable leadership in the world and the need for sustainable leadership in the world today. 
Well, in a lot of the work we're trying to do, it's a stakeholder. Look, we're trying to solve problems of the global commons. If you think about it, the pandemic, climate change, even international security, there's no one country that can solve climate change or member uh, on its own of the pandemic. It needs global solidarity, people coming together. So that's it. You know, when you have a problem that needs this kind of approach of people coming together, I think that's critical to be able to demonstrate that and for members of the WTO to see the complexity and know that they need to work together to deliver this. So that's one very important point. Now, that brings in stakeholders as well. It's not just WTO members, but the private sector, but civil society, it's government, uh, all have to weigh in. And actually, let's take our fisheries. Civil society was quite active, positively, and then in trips, they were critical. Uh, so when you see that the world is now a multiple stakeholder world in which we need all actors to be able to solve things, even those agreements that the WTO is working on, that's how you're able to show people in real life that you can't solve these mm. problems without everyone weighing in. We couldn't solve the pandemic without the brilliance of the private sector finding the vaccines. So that's one group of stakeholders. But at the same time, we couldn't solve it without finding a way to get poor countries through COVAX, the COVAX facility, to get some access. They didn't have the type of access they needed and they were at the back of the line, but they got some. So you needed that, you needed a public-private partnership, you needed civil society to weigh in with their views. So it's a multi-stakeholder world now. Mm. That's what we are living in for all the problems, including climate change. Think about it. It needs every single one, the individual, the corporation, the small and medium enterprise, the government, the big companies round the table to solve this. Thank you. So we like to end each podcast, um, Dr. Ngozi, with some rapid fire questions. This is where we're going to give you a series of five questions and we ask you to respond as quickly as possible. Question number one, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? A teacher, a professor. What's one important skill every person should have? The ability to get on with others. <laughs> Question number three, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? From my father, when I was going to university in the U.S., he said, you're a woman, a young woman, and you're black. If, if you ever encounter racism, it's not your problem. It's the problem of the other mm -hmm. person. So don't let it stop you. I was 18 plus 19 at the time, and I was saying, oh, what's he going on about? But it turned out to be a valuable piece of advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What current or historic leader do you admire the most? Hmm. <laughs> I, I admire Martin Luther King, Mandela, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, Grassa Michelle, and I could go on. What's your advice to listeners who may be thinking of taking on a new challenge or, or perhaps making a big change? Take the chance. Just take the chance. Many people are very risk averse, but you can mm -hmm. take considered risks and, um, you know, believe in, in what you're doing and go for it. Take a chance. Sometimes you, you might win. Sometimes you might mm -hmm. not win. But in, even if you don't win, you learn a lot from not winning. So I would say take the chance. Well, you've taken a lot of chances. One of them was coming on this podcast with us, and we are so appreciative and if we just reflect a little bit on some of the things you've talked about and the formative moment, talking about taking risk, growing up as a child with your parents not there, and you said you had an enchanted childhood. You said you lived with nothing and then you moved away and lived with everything. And it formed the values of who you are today and the sense of obligation to get the best education you could when for three years you had no education. I love the phrase of saying education is a luxury and we must do things for others because we had that luxury. I will go back to Nigeria and I will give back. But negotiating $30 billion of debt 
with some of the most sophisticated managers and world leaders in the world is something. And this anchoring around the values of a family and the values of serving a country, even in the crosshairs of your mother's kidnapping. And now we come to the WTO, that it's all about enhancing other people's lives. Again, this theme keeps coming through. And the fact that you would not accept no. You say you just keep working. Don't let them say the word no. You have to persist. You have to have the resilience. No one could leave until the deal was done. And you've made it very clear you need all the actors to come together. That those stakeholders of the WTO or governments or even the private sector, all the actors are living in a multi-stakeholder world. And we can't make progress without having the stakeholders at the same table. And when you have them at the same table, take risk. In your personal life at nine years old to fetch the water, to lock the ministers in the room to get the agreement, take risk. Believe in it. And whether you win or not, you learn a lot from when you don't win, and you're proud of when you do. But we are so appreciative, and you should know, a lot of people, men and women, list you as who they admire as a leader. Oh, really? Absolutely. Oh, that is really nice. <laughs> You've taken more risks than the average person we know, that's for sure. That is true. People, yeah, that is true. People tell me that all the time, and it's what defines my career. But I've taken risks to go for what I really want to do. Mm. Um, anything that will help me serve people. Thank you. Fantastic. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been fun. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com. Find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time. Do you have a question on leadership, career development, joining a board, or other topics you'd like to ask one of our consultants? Well, now's your chance. Send us your question. Email us at redefiners at russellreynolds.com for an opportunity to have your question answered on the podcast by one of our experts. See you next time on Redefiners.